Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Herrera, anesthesiology resident at Cruces University Hospital, not far away from here. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Pomposo for the invitation to be here today. Also to Dr. Ituri and Deorte, which are here today with us, which are my head neuroanesthesiologists and mentors at my center. So, um, I would like to start quoting Dr. Lobo in this uh, 2016 paper for anesthesia for awake craniotomy, uh, where he says that many different anesthetic approaches have been suggested for awake craniotomy. They differ mainly in the suggested drugs and how to deliver them and in airway management. Experienced neuroanesthetists have usually developed a preferred technique and believe their own approach to be the safest and the best. And so do we. So this is where we are heading to. We are heading to a scenario in where all medical specialties will need to provide quantifiable evidence of value, uh, meaning as outcomes relative to cost. And this is where we want to be. No? No, it's not working. OK, so we want to be on the gain of value square, OK? Decreased cost with increased effectiveness. We cannot forget that under the Affordable Care Act, 30% of the value-based payment modifier is patient experience metrics. So we will have to work with this. So was the neuroanesthesiologist added value in awake craniotomy? Because some, one might be tempted to think that if it's an awake surgery, we don't need a neuroanesthesiologist with us, OK? So we add increased effectiveness because we minimize procedure failure. Failure understood here as insufficient tumor resection. We minimize complications, controlling nausea, providing a relaxed brain so our surgeons can better operate on our patients, and diminishing the incidence of crisis. We increase patient's tolerance, providing ansiolysis, sedation, and analgesia, and we decrease the costs, because the sedation is always going to be cheaper than a general anesthesia and we much greatly increase patient satisfaction. So according to NOSEC, uh, what are the main causes of failure in a weight craniotomy? Three causes, inadequate selection of patients, inadequate anesthetic regime, and intraoperative crisis. We can treat crisis with cold irrigation and with medication. What can we do to improve the selections of patients that we make? And what can we do to uh, find a better and adequate anesthetic regime for every single of our patients? So we can do this through the pre-anesthetic assessment. The pre-anesthetic assessment is performed by the same neuroanesthesiologist that is going to provide anesthesia on the day of surgery. Its objective is to elaborate an individualized anesthetic regime for our patients. Okay, it has three parts. First of all, we have to provide comprehensive information about the anesthetic procedure and the surgical procedure. We have to build up a trust-based relationship with our patients. Second part is to identify those, the patient's character. We have to identify the patients that are going to be too anxious too fearful or too sleepy to cooperate during a uh, mapping phase. The third part is to identify risk factors. We have to identify those patients that are, are at higher risk of developing intraoperative crisis, at developing intracranial hypertension, and those patients that uh, might have a difficult airway management that can pretty much complicate greatly our anesthetic management intraoperatively. So um, how do we predict our patient's behavior? We have to uh, find those patients that are on the two streams of the spectrum, so the too sleepy to cooperate patient, the too anxious, too fearful to cooperate patient. How do we do this? With several items. For the too sleepy to cooperate patients, uh, as, as described by Ito, um, we have uh, the Stubbank score for obstructive sleep apnea, the Edwards sleepness scale, and the Cognizant construction and calculus items. As you can see on the image, that's one of the construction tasks that is part of the Cognizant test. So for the too anxious, too fearful to cooperate patients, we use a predicted pain scale. So we ask the patient to predict 
uh, the amount of pain that he or she thinks uh, he or she is going to experience uh, with different techniques during the surgery. And we also use the Hamilton anxiety scale. Why do we do this? Because we provide different sedation regimes for these patients. Because what we want is a cooperative patient. So this is the awake craniotomy procedure. On the first line, you have this surgery-related events. And on the second line, you have the anesthesia-related events. And on the third line, you have the patient-related events. So the first phase of the pre-mapping phase, in this phase, we're going to position the patient. We're going to perform regional blocks for adequate analgesia. And we will administer uh, proper drugs to have a deep sedation state that allows our surgeons to perform a good quality craniotomy. Second phase is the mapping or tumor resection phase. We need a cooperative patient, very lightly, lightly sedated. The third phase is the closure post mapping phase. Uh, we will provide deep sedation to have a comfortable patient and if needed, if accorded with our surgeons in a debriefing uh, session prior to the start of the surgery, if they consider, they predict that this phase is going to be longer or more painful than usual, we will provide general anesthesia. In any case, all along the, um, all along the procedure, we have to provide for safety and effectiveness. So this is how our operating room looks like during an awake craniotomy. We have the patient laying on a semi-lateral decubitus facing the anesthesia station and the new anesthesiologist at any time. So he or she will be able to communicate with us uh, any uncomfort or problems that might appear. So what is our favorite drug right now? Our sedative uh, drug right now is dexmedetomidine, also known as dex, which is a much shorter, easier uh, name to pronounce. Although it requires complementary analgesia, that's why we perform the regional blocks, um, the incidence of airway complications is much lower than with other sedative drugs that we used to use in the past. Um, it does have also a characteristic spectrogram that we can monitor during surgery, and it enables for cortical mapping. Also, they are preliminary, uh, very promising results with this drug that might, be, might have neuroprotective effects, but further studies are needed for this. So this is how the DEX spectrogram looks like. So you have a timeline, maybe on the white here we can see that, no. Nope. You have a white timeline, so it starts here on your left and goes to the right. On top, you have the spectrogram for the right hemisphere. Below, you have the spectrogram for the left hemisphere. Um, they are uh, in, um, in a specular fashion. So uh, the lower frequencies start in the middle of the, of the shade, of the slide, OK? So the red colors mean more power. The bluish colors mean less power. So you can see that um, at the end of the um, preparation uh, position of the patient, we administer the first bolus of dexmedetomidine and induce a deep sedation in our patient. You can see there's a pattern of slow delta and theta waves that corresponds pretty much to a, a non-REM uh, phase three of physiological sleep. At the point where we are getting to the f second part of our surgery, the mapping phase, we will stop the infusion of DEX. And after a short uh, period of time, we will start uh, seeing those alpha peaks. Uh, from the beginning of the appearance of the alpha peaks, the mean time of awakeness is 13 minutes for us, OK? So those alpha peaks. Uh, correspond to the spindles, and you can see also those beta uh, peaks. And this pattern looks pretty much like the non-REM uh, phase two of a physiological sleep pattern. So what complications do we have? Uh, most patients uh, have not had any complications so far. The most common complications are partial seizures, uh, around a third of our patients have experienced those. 
and then generalized seizures and some cases of desaturation. So um, I'm just about to finish. Uh, what are our outcomes? So we do, we perform a post-anesthetic assessment uh, 48 hours after surgery that is performed by the same neuroanesthesiologist that performed the pre-anesthetic assessment and the uh, anesthesia on the day of surgery. 100% of our, our patients so far do remember their neuroanesthesiologist uh, compared to a 15% to the rest of surgeries in general. 100% of them considered the information provided as satisfactory and the quality of care as beyond their expectations. Two-thirds of them considered the procedure as bearable and one-third of them considered the procedure even as pleasant. Uh, because there's room for improvement, their worst memory, uh, according to the pain scale, was the posture, something that we will have to improve in the future. So that's all, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.